but let me premise what I am seeing here on the fact that I am the granddaughter of a survivor of the 1937 riots. My grandmother was shot at um, what she would say, and it was an embarrassment to me at that time, but she would always tell me the story of how she was shot at Tiefing, according to her, Tiefing potato pickings from the Mount Plantation, St. George. She and her husband to feed three hungry children. The first at that time was my mother, age seven. And she would tell me how she dodged the bullet of the white officer on his horse and she tumbled down the incline not letting go of the crocus bag of sweet potato pickings and uh, that resonates with me knowing that the conditions back then were so harsh that forced my grandmother to steal potatoes and yet she survived and her life and contributions to my life have shaped who i am today therefore i have my crocus bag of potatoes on my head and i roll and tumble just like she did Secondly, I am here because mm -hmm. I am honored and privileged to have a father-in-law who was headed the secretariat. In fact, in many ways, he was the sole secretary to the beginnings mm -hmm. of the federation. Mm -hmm. And he would tell us about the experiences of those that tried to come together to form the Federation. And he served his country, this country, at highest level. He served in the early days of independence with the first prime minister. He was uh, an acting a deputy high commissioner to the um, British High Commission, the London High Commission, Barbados High Commission in London. He at times acted as high commissioner and he retired as a permanent secretary. And so he would tell us of the early days of pre-independence, pre independence and post-independence. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then here comes um, Edward Humphrey Walker, after whom the building at NIS is named after. He mm -hmm. and that the law were contemporaries, young civil servants together. And uh, they were quite close. Actually, they bought land together here at Manchester, St. Michael. They built their houses um, across from each other and they remained friends until their death. Humphrey preceded my um, father in law. But Uncle Humphrey was the first director of NIS um, when it was formed in June 1967. Actually, 
it was around his birthday at that time, his birthday. He was born in June. And uh, Uncle Humphrey served up until 1979 as director, the first director of NAS. And he would tell these stories and I about those early days and what prompted the conceptualization and the subsequent um, forming of the what is known today as the NIS and Humphrey, Uncle Humphrey would let me know that it evolved. I need some note that it evolved from a, 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 a decision to help the poor and to disadvantage the disenfranchised. So, and so the, the NIS, so the, the decision was to the the the. the the foundations of the NIS was to help the poor. Um, yes. That's really what it was all about. Okay, continue. I just want to make sure I understand that. Go ahead. And you would know too, Marcia, you, it would help to know that Humphrey at that time, I call him Humphrey because, you know, that was her affectionate term for him, Humphrey or Uncle Humphrey that he would have come from a background of helping as in welfare and being the chief probation officer and the chief welfare officer and being chosen um, at that period, soon after independence, to head the social security. And uh, he would tell us that repeat, he would repeat the story of the telephone call he received from the then prime minister, um, Arab Barra, one of our national heroes, Honor Rabbi Arab, His, his Excellency, the Honor Rabbi Arab Barra. He received a call a Saturday morning, I think he said, from Prime Minister Barrow, who said, um, Humphrey, I know that the NAS, the Social Security Funds, is they're sitting there. You've got quite a bit of money. I like some of that money to do, to undertake some projects. And Humphrey stopped him in his tracks and said, don't go any further. Not one blind right saint. That money is the money taken from the people, for the people, for the poor, for the transient persons who have no other source, no assets, or no other source of income to take care of them after uh, when they reach a certain age, pensionable age. You will not get one bl bl uh, blind right saint from that fund. Don't ask me. And he said, you know, the Prime Minister Barrow. Um, kept saying, I want some, uh, you know, what are you doing with the money? I want the money. And he said, over my dead body or I'll resign. I will resign and let the people know that you came for the money. And mm. with that, Humphrey was sometimes very robust <laughs> in his expressions. And he said he abruptly finished that conversation. And he was adamant, even when he recounted that that um, encounter, that that conversation, you could see the passion and the the annoyance as he relived it. 
he said how could he come for the people's money and he said i would prefer to resign than give him that money lose all my time in government than give him that money and he said a couple of days after he got another phone call from the prime minister and before prime minister barrow could start he asked him he tell i hope you don't come for that money because what i tell you before we mean you know uh -huh. get a red blind sign of that money it's not yours it's not a bank it's not a deep well or the pockets are not deep that you could put your hand in and say oh it's for the people and their future and he saw it as we say in the jingle it's a lifeline he saw it as a lifeline for for a particular group of persons who had no security the the the, the uh artisan the self-employed the 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 disenfranchised those who had no land no no asset to 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 ensure that they had a comfortable comfortable future and he would finish his story by saying the different said um i hear you i hear you I see I'm not going to get that money, something to that effect. And, you know, I kind of complimenting him for the position he took. And mm -hmm. then he reminded him, but you know who you're talking to? You're talking to the prime minister. He said, no, that dipper, but you're still in getting them. You, get <laughs> you know, you know, I love that story. I love that story. I don't know about Caswell, but I love hearing that story because we are hearing about Edward Humphrey Walcott, and he was the first director of the NIS, and he his heart was for the poor, and he was willing to stand up. Guys, how you feel about this story? Don't you love this story? And he was able to stand up to Errol Barrow, the father of this nation, and said, "You're not getting that money from the NIS, you know, because they see." The money. <laughs> and no Marcia and Caswell, and to whomever we are sharing this at the tomb ever that every time i sing the lines of our national anthem strict guardians of her heritage firm craftsmen of her faith i think of humphrey walker mm. because he exemplified that strict guardian of her heritage it wasn't that much at that time but it was sufficient enough for him to say i am guarding this mm. I'm guarding it because it is part of our faith it is part of what happens to us down the road and mm -hmm. then i i smile i i i i just love his the position he took yes but at the same time i wouldn't want to say i weep but at the same time i am concerned that we have fewer uh strict guardians of our heritage mm. we have fewer persons who will stand up and and get away from the narrative and i listened to quite a lot of narrative today in 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 the debate some gripping and riveting others could have been dispensed off in a matter of minutes I saw the, 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 in some of them, and I must compliment um, Senator Crystal Briggs, uh, as well as Dr. Christina Hines is her name, uh, the Honorable Dr. Chelsea Graffit, to some extent. 
the path that you saw a semblance of that um, guardianship um, concerns and, and, and if I can speak to uh, Dr. Bradford, he started, I made a note here, may look at that note in a minute, and he said, uh, I made a note, not funds of government, not to be used as development funds by government, but for the people, the, the funds are for the people, put there by the people, and therefore any use of those funds should be more for development initiative for the people. And that gave me some kind of comfort to hear some uh, echoing of what um, Humphrey, Uncle Humphrey would have said in more robust terms. And similarly, uh, what um, Senator Crystal Drakes would have uh, posited in her uh, delivery and we need more of that. Here I am saying, make sure that you guard the funds, however you, you treat them. I mean, um, Caswell could speak more to that. But I would like us to, in this forum, and as we engage in educating and informing and enlightening and, 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 and and engaging persons that we become the the the, the uh, guardians of our heritage since there is not an opposition in the lower house or in the upper house we need to be those guardians of our heritage Heritage is something that has been put in place to be enjoyed now and for the future. And therefore, we need to take, take up that mantle that um, I listened, I took notes today. And what I have found beyond, you know, some historical overview of framework, where dates are, are, are given, you know, of the how the fund evolved and where it came from in terms of, of the colonial days and the 1800s up to pre independence. But it is just a rhetorical account of facts, a rhetorical account of historic uh, events, but there is no gut to it. It is not premised in, in what we would call the socioeconomic conditions of that time that prompted it. And it is like, okay, here's the background to it. Let us pass forward into the present and propel into the future. Mm, and that excellent. Is, is, is what concerns me, that there are those gaps that account for why this thing happened, mm -hmm. how it got here, how it was preserved, and in a sense to how it has been misused. Yes. And to hasten into any uh, any period, I'm looking for a word, into any activity that is rushed and not thought through. I am sensing like, okay, okay, let's move on. You know how um, mm -hmm. say hear you, hear you. Let's get on mm -hmm. and sell mm -hmm. on and to the latest, latest, uh, the latest trend and mm -hmm. I'm it as the latest trend. And mm -hmm. that would encourage us 
that although it has been passed in the upper senate that we remain the strict guardians of our heritage and before i go martia yes share it briefly with you and with caswell i worked in the as a teacher for several years and then i resigned and i went into um other jobs which were interesting which were paying well and met my niece at that time i remember some of them there was NIS reduction, but as time progressed, I was getting not steady long-term employment. It was more short-term or less uh, projects, unpredictable. As the need arose, you know how it goes, Marcia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The roles you were called in. I remember being concerned that on reaching the age that I am now, that I would not have enough, yes, I would have enough contributions in from my past um, employment with government as a teacher, but I would not have enough to give me a comfortable contributory pension right as well am i explaining it all right i would not have enough uh, to get to, to be comfortable and here i am starting to work from age 17. i called up nix repeatedly until i reached the depth of the one of the former directors and i put my case to him i said look i would like to make my own contribution mm -hmm. increase you know increase what i have so that i would have a more comfortable retirement uh, pension or retiring I explained my position and my willingness. I said, I'm not employed in the public sector or the private sector. I don't have a small business. I work on contract, but there are unpredictable. There are seasonable and there are, are seasonal, but I am willing to continue in. Mm -hmm. Please tell me what to do chuckled he laughed he said this is new to me i never had this kind of thing i never thought of it i said i'm putting a case now the persons like myself out there who want to but we don't fit into the categories you have please look at it and um make provision i'm willing to pay he said that, you know, that the work I don't fit into any category. Needless to say, I am going to get a pension next year. But I am not satisfied with what I'm going to get, knowing that I need a personal plea to make my own contribution when i was able to or give me some kind of skill where that i could pay a lump sum or make arrangements to pay however but i wanted to build up my lifeline mm -hmm. and that director the one who was supposed to head and manage and think strategically and put strategic systems in place and be a visionary never acted on that 
And therefore, there are so many of us out there who wanted to, 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 to make our contribution. We are now uh, left out there because of lack of vision. And I am saying that the way forward need not just uh, 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 after the fact uh, 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 a reaction, but there should be strategic action. And I'm talking about um, over two decades, about two decades. Mm -hmm. I was very much in my prime two decades when I approached that person. I I I I, I hear the um, the disillusion you decades in that mm -hmm. one that second rose one second rose that contribution and I close thank you I, I you're welcome that is exactly what we were talking about earlier putting people in place that don't know the job but just because they have, they have connections I I think I know who that director is trust me he came from outside of national insurance didn't have a clue he became director he left national insurance and he still didn't have a clue my thing is all that she asked for was already provided for in the legislation because if you're a self-employed person you pay contributions a quarterly basis the minimum contribution you will pay is on 91 dollars a month so if you are not paying, if, let's say this month you don't make any money, you'll mm -hmm. pay the contribution of $91. And if you make, you make money, you pay on what you make. Because because your income fluctuates, you pay on what you earn. Mm -hmm. He sat at the top, didn't have a clue, messed up everything he put his hand on. As a matter of fact, he bought a computer system for national insurance for $9 million. And after fixing it for $60 million, they still have to go and get a new one. This is what we are talking about. You put the wrong people in the wrong place. And this is what will happen when you make these changes in national insurance. You're going you're gonna to be able to put more of your yard folks more easily. Because you see, our constitution was amended in 1974 to provide that the, that the prime minister must be consulted on who should become permanent secretaries, deputy permanent secretaries, heads of departments and de and their deputies. It doesn't say that the Prime Minister makes a decision, but from Tom Adams' time, because when Bob Miller's amendments, he never had a chance to use them because he, he lost office. So when, and the thing is, Bob, the Barbers, their party said that the amendments were wrong and they're going to repeal them as soon as they get power. The march they got most and everything. Those amendments are still there. And the prime ministers are still being consulted on who should become um hey so they are not only consulted but who decide that the who will become the head of the department so when you put these people as head of the department that don't have a clue this is what happens rose don't get a proper pension and as a result of this so and and no this with these amendments to the national insurance and social security act it will now become widespread you wouldn't only have to be consulted. You wouldn't. You wouldn't have only do the director and the deputy. You would be able to do it from the mid up. The politicians will have control of everything in national insurance, the staff and the funds. It will be their slush fund. That's what it's all about. And if Barbados don't wake up, um, you can still be a little bit. You got left. But I think they might still be ramming when you get old. <laughs> so it was, you would have to use that. Because they're going to use it. They're going to use the money and they keep on using it. Trust me. Look, we're yeah. on Barbados. You can see all the projects that were built on the national insurance funds. And I don't know if national insurance is getting the rent for the buildings that the government is renting from them. Because the government don't pay its bills. You got help for the government to pay a bill. So every government got to pay a bill where the minister is responsible. And the minister, the minister, and the pay right the minister. Mm -mm. <laughs> and I mean, they're putting their own people. They were, I mean, with this new bill, 
um, they want to put seem to seemingly um, want to put their own people. They want to have you know be able to to staff the NIS, and that's where Caswell is saying we have to be careful of. I want to thank Miss um, Corbin for Mrs. Corbin Rose Corbin for coming on tonight.